Hi, my name's Ilanka. My day job is that I make computer games. And I've also got some interesting side hobbies. And one of those is cryptography. And I've had hobby that kind of leads to hobby and leads to hobby and has led me to the Knights Templar and specifically the facts and fiction about the Knights Templar because there's a whole lot of fiction out there about the Knights Templar. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, several elements, many of them that have been brought into popular culture by this book, The Da Vinci Code, by Dan Brown that has that wonderful thing at the beginning that says all descriptions are accurate. No, no, they're, they're not. But, um, but Dan Brown, and I know Dan Brown, because I've helped him with some of the research for some of his novels. He actually named a character after me in one of his books, uh, The Lost Symbol, which is the sequel to The Da Vinci Code. There's a character in there called Nola K, which is an anagram form of Ilanka. And some of you may enjoy, if you do have this particular edition of The Da Vinci Code, there are puzzles hidden in the artwork of the book jacket. There are five puzzles which are giving clues to the subject of his next novel. And he's done the same thing in, in other books as well. Two of these puzzles that are in the artwork of the book jacket here refer to a sculpture at CIA headquarters at Langley, Virginia, called Kryptos. And Kryptos is a famous sculpture. It's about 12 feet tall, 20 feet long, has thousands of characters carved into it. Um, and it's a series of ciphers. It's a challenge to the uh, folks at the CIA. Of the four ciphers, three of the four have been solved. The fourth has not been solved yet. It's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. And I'm going to be giving a talk about cryptos later on in the convention. But let's come back to the Knights Templar a bit. So um, Dan Brown, because he was uh, cryptos was going to be a theme in his novel, uh, contacted me. I was one of the world's leading authorities on the crypto sculpture. So he would call me up and he'd ask me questions and I'd answer him. And and that's why he he named a character after me and. Because I was helping, I was like, oh, I, I should probably go read his book. So I went and I read The Da Vinci Code. And there's all this stuff in there about the Knights Templar. And, and uh, it, it sparked my interest in what was real and what was not real. So I, I did quite a bit of research. And I actually spoke to many uh, PhD medieval, medievalists, medieval history professors. And I've been to some conferences and, and did a lot of reading. And uh, just very interesting in sifting what's where. And another of my hobbies is I write articles on Wikipedia. I've written about 500 articles there, many in the field of medieval history. So many of you will know a famous date that's associated with the Knights Templar, October 13th, 1307. And I actually arranged uh, for the article about the Knights Templar on Wikipedia to be on the front page of Wikipedia on October 13th, 2007, the 700 year anniversary of the arrests. Uh, kind of for fun. So much, if you read the Knights Templar article on Wikipedia, much of it there was, was written by me or is being maintained by me. I cannot take credit for anything that's there in any particular nanosecond because Wikipedia changes very rapidly, but I go in periodically and, and do some cleanup. So um, about the Knights Templar, we have lots of different legends, you know, Rosalind Chapel and the Holy Grail. How is that associated with the Templars? I'll be talking a bit about that. Uh, this image of, of Baphomet, you know, is it true that the Templars were involved in devil worship? Uh, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, the Shroud of Turin, is that connected with the Templars? And it, it actually is, and, but uh, not in the way that some people may think. Um, so I'll talk about that. And there's just so much out there. This is a painting from Versailles. There's a, they have many large paintings in the art gallery there in the Hall of Crusades. One of these massive paintings is called Jacques Molay Takes Jerusalem 1299. And you see this and you think, wow, someone put a lot of research into that. There was a big battle and Jacques de Molay was there and that's when he captured Jerusalem. Except there was no such battle. And Jacques de Molay was definitely not leading any charge and, and Jerusalem was not, there, there was no battle at Jerusalem in that year. So I'm going to talk about how these stories kind of came together. Um, and there is a lot of fiction out there about the Templars as well. Of course, we have the Da Vinci Code, we have Ivanhoe, we have Umberto Eco's Folk Cults Pendulum. I'll talk briefly about those and I, I think I mentioned Lost Symbol. And it doesn't have to be books, it can be games as well. Assassin's Creed has a lot of information about the Templars. So, but let's, let's go to Da Vinci Code specifically, because I'm really going to dig into to what he talks about here. How many people here have read the Da Vinci Code? Just kind of curious. Okay, all right, good. And I, I tell people, you say, you know, if you want to learn about history and, and art and things, don't read a Dan Brown novel. But, 
But if you're just going to the beach, you know, and you want a book, and you just want to sit, and you just want something that's going to keep you turning pages, and you don't want to think too hard, perfection. You know, it's, it's entertaining stuff. It's light. But just, just don't think that everything in there is, is true. So he says these things about everything in, in this novel is accurate, and, and it's not. So, but where did he get his information? Because it, there's a, a fair case to be said, well, maybe he believed that it was accurate. Well, a lot of his information he got from this book, a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. It was published in 1982 by Bajent Lee and Lincoln. And, and it, this was not a work of fiction. I, I wouldn't even call it pseudo-fiction. Maybe pseudo-history would, would be a better way of describing it. But it, it had a list of facts in there. And one of the facts, they said, well, we, we know this and we don't know that. But, but one of the things that, that we know as a fact is the Priory of Sion is a real organization that was founded in 1099 and had a series of grandmasters, including Leonardo da Vinci. And, and no, that, that's not true either. But did they make it up? Well, no, they got their information from somewhere else, and I'll, I'll kind of go into that. And in my slides, it's a subtle thing, but I've tried to put the stuff that's not true in italics and the stuff that is true in non-italics. It's not 100%, but it, you know, it can help a little bit because it does get pretty confusing. So, so the Prior of Sion. Now, according to Da Vinci Code, all right, they got it from Holy Blood, Holy Grail. They said it was founded in 1099. Da Vinci Code said it had a series of secret grand masters, and the Priory founded the Knights Templar as their military arm. And there were documents verifying this, that the Priory of Sion existed, and that these documents were found in a pillar in a French church in the 1800s by a priest named Berenger Saunier. So there was a priest named Berenger Saunier, and he was involved with very interesting conspiracy. And there were articles about, and books, about Berenger Saunier finding something in a pillar in a church. Doesn't mean it was true, but all of this was printed at a time. So now let's go, what's, what's real, according to the, the PhDs that I've spoken to and, and the, uh, the history courses. You know, Knights Templar, the reality, they did exist. They were a very well-known, not a secret society, they were a very well-known organization of, of basically the first warrior monks. They were religious men, but they also carried weapons. They existed for a couple hundred years, around the time of the Crusades, 1119, ballpark, you can get into some debate there, but to 1312. But, but they weren't like secretive, nobody knew about them. Everybody knew about the Templars. They were involved in every aspect of society. And, and calling them the world's first multinational corporation. So think of the Templars not as a you know, secret society doing voodoo, but think of them more like Microsoft, okay? The, these were people, they were involved with, with money and financial transactions. Now Microsoft didn't have a military arm, but they were, they were really involved in everything. And the big thing right around them was the Crusades. So yes, they, they had a military arm and that, and that was the reason that they were formed. And their main raison d'etre was to defend the Holy Land. So this is, uh, a map of the eastern Mediterranean there, the little orange island up there is Cyprus. And, and the, uh, the Templars had fortresses all up and down the coast there. So uh, kind of very briefly, the Crusades, the Pope said, hey, we need to go retake Jerusalem, and a bunch of Europeans went down and across to capture Jerusalem. The Muslims were not very organized at the time, and Jerusalem was taken, and it was a, it was a big mess. Um, and then eventually the Muslims got their act together and kicked the Christians back off the continent. I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong, that's you know, just kind of the fact of what's going on. So after Jerusalem was taken, it was a really dangerous area. And the, the, the Christians, the Europeans were like, oh cool, we own Jerusalem now, we want to go visit Jerusalem. They wanted to have tourists that would go and, and see the holy places. But they could take boats down there and get to the coast, but then it, they'd have to travel overland to Jerusalem, and it was a lawless time, and the pilgrims were getting slaughtered. Uh, and so Hugh de Payon, who was a, a, a soldier, a veteran of the First Crusade, he came up with an idea. He said, how about we put together an order that's going to protect these pilgrims as they're traveling to the Holy Land. So uh, he, he came from the northern part of France and he got together with a bunch of his relatives and they went and they pitched it and they said, hey, can we set up this order in, in Jerusalem in order to protect the, the pilgrims? And the answer was yes. The, the uh, King Baldwin um, was, was thrilled at the idea of having some help in a very lawless area. And they had uh, the Christians had set up shop on the, the Temple Mount, which is a, a very famous area. Um, you've got the, the gold dome, the dome of the rock, um, and then there, there's other famous things. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse 
as it's moving around. So we, we have the Dome of the Rock with the gold dome, and then the gray, this is the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, I'll talk about that. If you've heard of the Wailing Wall, uh, which is a very holy area in Judaism that's there. And this whole area was the Temple of Solomon and where, you know, where God gathered the dust to create Adam. There's all kinds of legends associated with this area. It's very important to multiple religions. Um, supposedly, it's where the, the Ark of the Covenant was kept for a while, and, and it's referred to in the Bible. If you go, like where Jesus chased away the money changers, all of that happened in this area in Jerusalem. So, so the Crusaders are there, and, and they kind of set up their, their corporate headquarters on the Temple Mount. Very briefly about the Muslims, what, what their legends about it were, um, it wasn't the holiest site in Islam, but it was, it was definitely high up there. One of the, the big stories in, in Muslim tradition is called the night journey, the Isra and Miraj, where Muhammad was resting in Mecca, and then a, and he had a journey to, the city is not specified, but it's called the farthest mosque. And he traveled on this creature was, which was called a burak, which is sort of a, a flying beast with the face of a woman, sort of think a Pegasus kind of creature, but it, it's specific to a, a Muslim tradition. And so he travels on the burak, and actually the airlines, right, if you, al burak is named after this particular story, this flying creature, sort of you, yeah, Pegasus Airlines. And, the, uh, and so he went to this farthest mosque in the story, and then he came down and he, he prayed a bit, and then the Burak took him up into heaven, where he met Allah. And, uh, and he met other prophets as he was going up there, and, and God, Allah, was telling him to take messages back down to the people on earth, and saying to, uh, you know, tell everyone down there to pray 50 times a day. And so Muhammad is coming back down, and the other prophets, you know, what did God say? And he said, well, you know, he said to tell everybody to pray 50 times a day. And Moses was like, they won't do it. Go up, ask for a reduction. So <laughs> this, is, this is the way the story goes. So, so Muhammad goes back up, and, you know, he, and he, they negotiate, um, and, and he gets it down to five times a day, right? <laughs> okay, and then comes back down, comes down to this area of the fire, this mosque, gets back on the burak, flies to Mecca. I'm taking a big, long thing, and I'm shortening it for this. But that rock where Muhammad was is the rock that is under this gold dome, the Dome of the Rock. They believe Muslim tradition, they believe that is, it's from there that Muhammad went up into heaven. So again, going here, we have, if you go to this area, there's a large rock in there, the, the, the foundation stone. Now, after the, the Muslims, uh, this was, oh gosh, what was it? This was in, Muhammad lived around the 600s, and then uh, the Muslims, when they took the city in the 700s, this is before the Crusades, okay? And actually, I have a slide here. Okay. And the uh, Muslim leader said, okay, here's where the farthest mosque must be. There were no mosques there, but he decided to say, okay, we're going to say here. This is where Muhammad must have traveled to. And they built a mosque, which they called Al-Aqsa Mosque, which means the farthest mosque. Okay. Um, even though none of this was specified in the tradition, the tradition could have been Medina, it could have been Jerusalem, just the farthest mosque. But this is the building where the Templars set up shop during the Crusades. And this is where they kept their horses and stables and, and they're there for a while. Now, it was controversial because here they are, they're a religious order, but they're also carrying weapons. And they were taking some heat for that in Europe. And, but they had a very, very uh, powerful supporter, St. Bernard, St. Bernard de Clairvaux, and he wrote very persuasively on their behalf. For example, to say, a Templar knight is truly a fearless knight and secure on every side, for his soul is protected by the armor of faith, just as his body is protected by the armor of steel. He is thus doubly armed and need fear neither demons nor men. So the, the uh, seniors of the church got together and they discussed this idea of the Templars, and they decided, yes, we're going to give it the official approval of the church. The Templars are an approved organization, an approved charity, all right? So now, all across Europe, people are, that are wanting to give money to the Crusades, where do you give it to? Well, now they have the Templars. This is something that has the, the authority, the backing of the church, and so everybody, this is when you hear people giving tracts of land, huge tracts of land. They were giving them to the Templars. They were giving them money. They were giving them their, their sons to join the order because all of this was, their way, this, way, uh, this was their way of supporting the fight in the Holy Land. 
And the Templars had a very specific rule, which was designed by St. Bernard de Clairvaux. And this was uh, very closely aligned with another order that he'd been involved with, the Cistercian order. Um, so if you've heard of, of Galahad and all the rules that Galahad had, they, these kind of came from St. Bart, St. Bernard and these rules. So the Pope then gave the Templars even more power. In 1139, he did what was called a, a papal bull, which is a, a, a pronouncement, omnidatus optimum. I don't speak Latin, so I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But he declared that not only were the Templars this favored charity now, they were now exempt from all local laws. They didn't have to go through border checkpoints and deal with all the things of the different countries because they're going back and forth to the Holy Land. So they could just go freely through all the borders. They didn't have to pay any taxes. They were not subject to any authority except that of the Pope, which sounds really good to the Pope. But all the kings and queens are like, hey, wait a minute. What's this armed force that's now traveling through our lands here? So, so f some friction w was starting around then. So a, a little bit about the organization of the Templars. Uh, they were knights. And to be a, a Templar knight, you had to be descended from, you had to have knightly descent. You needed to be from the right class of society. The, te the knights wore white robes. They had a red cross. Then there was also a class of sergeants. They wore brown robes or black robes. And then there was clergy as well. And the Templars, they were well-funded military. They were the heaviest armament of the day. They had the best horses. They had well-trained horses. They had well-trained, very armed horses. And when there was a battle, the Templars would be in the front. And it didn't matter you know, if, the, if the, uh, the Muslim part of the army was there. The Templars would just be going straight at them, suicide charge, a way to break the lines. And, and the Muslims actually had a lot of respect for the Templars because of the, the amazing fighters that they were, the amazing warriors that they were. And, and the Templars had rules that, you know, they were going to stay and fight until their flag had fallen, right? They were not going to leave the battlefield. And if their flag did fall, they were also supposed to look to see if there was one of the other orders there, such as the Knights Hospital, uh, uh, Malta, um, and, and join and rally under those flags and keep fighting. So the, the organization of the Templars, they had a master in each region. These were the different regions where Templars existed. And there was one grand master, the CEO, so to speak, of the entire organization. And this was a lifetime appointment, though sometimes that could be very short because of the, the warrior nature of the Templars. And so some you know, leading the charge and up, oh, we need a new grand master tomorrow because we, we've just lost the old one. But um, the, you can go through and you can see the list of grand masters. And they built several things around. They, they built churches, they built um, places to store armament and places also to store um, money because one of their things to do was to protect the pilgrims that were traveling from Europe to Jerusalem. And one of the things that made pilgrims an attractive target was because they were carrying money with them. So the Templars actually instituted a way, a letter of credit. You could deposit your money with the Templars, say in London or in Paris. The Templars would give you a letter, and then you would take that letter with you to Jerusalem, where you would hand it off to the Templars, and they would give you some money back. That way you're not carrying this money and be becoming a, such a target for thieves as you're traveling across. Um, they tended to build round buildings, and these were based on the shape of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was in Jerusalem. Now, they did have a secret initiation ceremony um, where the initiates had to take various vows of chastity and piety and poverty and obedience. Um, and you can still see remnants of Templars, in, like in London, if you've seen like the Temple Tube Station, that's based on the Templars. It goes back to that history of it. And um, oh, I think I talked a little bit about the banking already. And also, if someone was going off to the Crusades and they had farms or vineyards, who would run them while they were gone? Well, sure, you could maybe give it to your neighbor, you could give it to your, to your relative who might or might not run it well, but more often they would put it under the, the Templars. The Templars would run these businesses for you while you were gone, and you could trust them. Also, if you had, like, you wanted to save retirement assets, you know, give these to the Templars. The Templars were known for guarding things, and, and we'll get into this in, in a bit. So several battles that the Templars were involved with. One of the turning points was the Battle of the Horns of Hattin. Saladin, who was a really interesting guy, I did, very well respected, very tolerant. Um, and uh, I enjoy what I read about Saladin. Um, but eventually, under such leaders as Saladin, the Muslims got their act together, kicked the Christians off the continent. Jerusalem fell in 1187. So now the Crusader headquarters, where is it now? If they don't have Jerusalem, they retreated to a city on the coast called Acre, Acre. 
Um, but then that one took another hundred years, but eventually they lost that one too. And then they retreated to the island of Cyprus. And, and that from there, they're saying, okay, how do we get back onto the continent? And so with this losing battle of the Crusades, Europeans were not as excited about giving all this money to the Templars. It's great when you're giving money to the winning side, but with the losing side, it's like, yeah, maybe there's other places you want to be spending your money. Um, also, some of the friction, as I brought up before, about the, the uh, European leaders, when they needed money, they would borrow money often from the Templars. And one of those in particular was heavily in debt to the Templars, was King Philip IV. And he was um, someone that if he didn't get his way, he would figure out a way to get his way. Um, he, he would um, bully, he bullied the Pope. Um, there was a, a Pope, um, Philip wanted something to happen, Pope Boniface VIII objected and Philip had him kidnapped and then charged the Pope with heresy. Okay, and then Bonaventure, he was an older guy at the time, so he was rescued, the people rose up and rescued the Pope, but he died about a month later. So cardinals get together, they go into conclave, they choose another Pope, Pope Benedict. He died a few months later, possibly because Philip had sent some, some folks to poison him. Cardinals get back together in conclave, what do we do? They stayed in conclave for a year, trying to figure out who do we appoint? Finally, they chose someone a Frenchman who had been a childhood friend of Philip's, named, who became Pope Clement, and he actually moved the papacy from Italy to France, so it could be more under Philip's control. So if you ever hear of the Avignon papacy, that was this particular time in history. So Philip owes a lot of money to the Templars, and he decides, well, let's just disband the Templars, and then he doesn't owe them any more money. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to deal with the, with the debt. So he, because he's really got Pope Clement kind of under his thumb, tells the Pope, says, we're going to disband the Templars. And Philip puts out orders so that all Templars in the French jurisdiction would all be arrested on a specific day. It, it was a dawn raid that was going to happen all across France. And it did happen. It was October 13th, 1307. Happened to be a Friday. Not the origin of Friday the 13th. I'll go into that. Um, but um, yeah, Templars were arrested all across France, including the Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. Other European leaders, they, they were horrified at what was going, they, they weren't in support of this, but Philip had that control, and Philip had the Templars tortured into forced confessions to say certain, I mean, burning their feet until they admitted that they had done this or that. And under torture, people are gonna say pretty much anything you want them to say. And also, he was charging them with heresy. It was pretty much the same thing, charges that he trumped up against the Pope that he'd kidnapped not so long ago. So he was now doing this against the Templars. So continuing to bully the current Pope, Pope Clement, Clement issues a papal bull, Pastoralis Prementientiae, I think, and which is arrest all the Templars, not just in France, but arrest all of them in Europe, seize their assets, get their money. Um, so Philip, there's still a lot of controversy about this, but Philip's takes, or Philip takes the information from the forced confessions and some of the Templars who had legal experience, these were educated men, and he says, no, 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 burn them at the stake. That way they can't defend themselves because they're dead. Um, and, and so it was, it was really messy business, really instigated by, by Philip. Um, and then there were more papal bulls that came from Pope Clement, disband the Templars, this was in 1312, and ad providam, which is take anything left from the Templars and give it to one of the other orders, Knights Hospital. So the last Grand Master was Jacques de Molay, and he was, he was arrested on that day, October 13, 1307, tortured, forced to confess, kept in jail. Then he recanted, um, but then he was, you know, and then he, he, I think he just got tired of it after a while. He'd been in prison for so long, and they said, you need to recant or you're going to be burned, and he wouldn't recant, and so they burned him at the stake. And this was in 1314, the painting of it. Um, and there were two of them. It was um, uh, Jacques de Molay and also uh, Geoffrey de, de Charnay. They were burned on an island in, in the Seine, the River Seine in Paris. And according to legend, okay, witnesses, you know, according to legend, he called out from the flames that both Philip and Clement would meet him before God. And sure enough, Philip died not too long later and Clement died not too long later. So this is, this is really capturing public ima imagination. Now what happened to the rest of the Templars? Well, it wasn't like the Templars were a separate race, you know, that, that like, like the lost tribe of the Jews. These were people that were in a job. Again, think Microsoft employees. So some of them were, were tried, some were convicted, 
you know, some, some were, were cleared. Many were just pensioned off saying, okay, go retire. Some of them just switched and joined the Knights Hospital, joined one of the other orders. In, in Portugal, what they did is they just changed the name of their order. Say, oh, you don't, you don't want Templars? Okay, we're no longer Templars. Now we are the Order of Christ. And that was their way of kind of switching, getting away from, uh, from Philip's wrath there. Uh, this is a, a picture of one of the Templar buildings, again, this round building in, in Portugal. So that's what's known. That's what's considered to be the fact of what's going on. So Friday the 13th, did it come from the Templars? No, 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 no. It, this was not a popular term until the early 1900s. If you go and you look at dictionaries of folklore and phrase and fable, look at all things, it'll say Friday, unlucky day. And you'll see 13, unlucky number, but there's no entry for Friday the 13th. That didn't start until about 100 years ago. Um, then there's this thing about Baphomet. Did, did uh, the Templars, were they, were they devil worshipers? Well, no. During the forced confessions, the word Baphomet does show up, but the spelling was really awful in these where they were transcribing the confessions. And it's generally agreed that they were saying the word Muhammad and those that were transcribing were writing it as some form of, of Baphomet at the time. This image of the sabbatic goat, that wasn't even drawn until the 1800s, completely different artist. So people say, oh yeah, this is what they worship. No, it, it's all kind of this mixture of things that, that, was, that was coming forward. Um, then there, I'm talking about the Holy Grail a little bit. This was, did the Templars have the Holy Grail? No. Uh, the Holy Grail, the easiest way to describe it is fan fiction, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is a poem that was the first mention of the Holy Grail. And I'm not talking about the Chalice of the Last Supper. I'm talking about the Holy Grail. The first mention of this Grail was in the 12th century in a poem called Percival, Le Comte du Graal, the story of the Grail, written by Chrétien de Troyes. It was an unfinished story, but it had fascinating imagery in it. So here, here's something from it. I'm going to tell you the French, and then I'll tell you the English. Une demoiselle très belle et élancée, bien parée, qui avec les valets venait, tenait un graal entre ses mains. Quand on la salle, elle fut entrée avec le graal qu'elle tenait. Une si grande lumière en vain que les chandelles ont perdu leur clarté, comme les étoiles qu'on se lève, soleil ou lune. All right, English. A beautiful girl, slender and well dressed came in with the servants, holding a grail in her hands. As she entered the room with the grail, which she held, such a great light came that the candles lost their brilliance, as do stars upon the rising of the moon or the sun. I mean, beautiful, beautiful imagery. And the context in the story was that Percival, who was on this journey, had been told he talked too much. And so he was trying not to speak when he was in this, this castle of the Grail. And then comes this procession through, and there's a lance, and the lance is bleeding, and this beautiful girl holding this Grail in this great light. And he wants to ask, what's going on? But he, he, keeps, his, he keeps his silence as this procession goes through. Then the next morning, his, his host has died, and he's told that he should have asked. He should have asked not just what is the Grail, but who are they serving? And so... Then the, and then the story was never finished. So it's this fascinating, what was the grail? What was in the grail? Who were they serving with this, this wonderful, magical grail there? And so continuations were being written of this story. What was that grail? What was in it? Who were they serving? And, and it started getting conflated with other stories. The idea of, well, maybe the grail was like a cornucopia and there was food in there. And then someone said, well, grail, and then they started calling the grail holy, a holy grail. And well, what were they serving? Were they, were they going, you know, who was, was it Jesus? Were they going to serve Jesus? Did, did the grail have special healing powers? And, and all, all of these stories and speculations were going on. And also, where is the grail now? Forgetting that it's fiction, now it's like, where is the grail now? Well, if it's a treasure and it's being guarded, who's probably guarding it? The Templars, all right? So you get this thing of, of Templars guarding these treasures. So, so now we're, we're going to come back kind of modern day. So we have Roslyn Chapel. And, and uh, so this was built in the, in the 1400s. And it, it has 
many very interesting carvings around it, and some of them include some Templar symbols. Now remember, the Templars were disbanded in the early 1300s, but there were many families who were still very proud of the fact that perhaps there was someone in their family, or someone in their family really was, had been a Templar. There was still a great deal of pride associated there. So it would not have been unusual to have, if you had the, the funding for it, to create things saying, yes, we were based on the Templars. We, we had members of the Templars in our family. Um, and there were also some, some Masonic images there. And uh, Masa the Freemasonry, that's a whole nother talk I can give here. So I'm not going to go into the details of Freemasonry. But Freemasonry started emerging around the 1700s. And so you know, all of these symbols are all kind of getting meshed together. Um, an another thing associated with the Templar, and I'll come back to that in a minute, was the, the Shroud of Turin. And this shroud was first publicly displayed in 1357. Remember, 1307, this is when the Templars were arrested, and so there's still all the stuff going on about the Crusades. Well, who had the shroud? Well, it was the family of Geoffrey de Charnay, the other guy who was burned at the stake next to Jacques de Molay. So there is a connection there. Now, the carbon dating for the shroud, again, that's a whole other talk that can be given about what is the Shroud of Turin. So I'm not going to go there except to say that the carbon dating says late 1200s or so. So now let's come back to the, the Priory of Sion. Supposedly, the Priory of Sion had founded the Templars as their military arm. No. The, the Priory of Sion, you can't find the Priory of Sion in, in historical documents. When did the Priory of Sion kind of emerge? It emerged in the 1950s. This was an organization, it was a hoax that was created by a Frenchman named Pierre Plontard. And Pierre Plontard was trying to make a case that he was descended from lines of kings and that therefore he should be made king. But, <laughs> okay, and, and to support his claim, and he had these wonderful you know, family trees showing this and that, but it wasn't just what he said, he was forging documents to support his case about the Prior of Sion, and he was planting these documents in different areas around France. He planted some of these documents in the French National Library. He planted others of them in a book about a small town in France called Rennes-le-Château. Okay. Rennes-le-Château, tiny little village in the south of France, think Roswell, think Area 51, Anything weird, spooky goes on probably is happening at Rennes le Chateau. That's kind of the reputation that it has in southern France, okay? Loch Ness, think Rennes le Chateau. And, and it was the center of conspiracy theories in France since the 1950s. Well, why? Okay, so let's go into that. Let's go Rennes le Chateau, tiny village, about 100, 100 people, permanent population. But it had stories around it that had been coming from the late 1800s where there was a priest named Father Berenger Saunier who had come into a lot of money. And so there was speculation, where did he get his money? And rumors, 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 rumors. Now fast forward, 1950s, and there's an innkeeper, Noel Corbeau, who's opened up an inn, a bed and breakfast in Rennes de Chateau, and he's not getting a lot of business. So what do you do if you're not scrupulous and you have a hotel and you're not getting enough business? You want to come up with a story that's going to get people to come to your area. What are their stories? They're going to say there's a ghost or they're going to say that there's a buried treasure somewhere around. So that's what Noel Corbeau did. He started talking about Berenger Saunier and how he had heard that Saunier's treasure was buried somewhere near Rennes-le-Chateau. So this story is going through the papers and Pierre Plontard doing his prior of Sion, I should be king of France thing, he decided to use some of those conspiracy theories as a way of advancing his own case. I know it's complicated, and I'll try to tie it all together. So he, he was already had been a convicted con man, and he founded his society, and he planted these documents, and he planted some of the documents in a book about Rennes-le-Chateau, which was called Le Trésor Maudit the accursed treasure of Rennes-le-Chateau. And so in this book, which was written by a friend of his, Gerard de Sede, it talked about this priest, Berenger Saunier, had opened up a pillar when he was renovating the church, had opened this pillar and had found these documents. And the documents are being reproduced in the book. The documents are forged, no such documents, but the book's saying, hey, you know, the documents, so it must be real because it's in print, right? No. So this book, now we fast forward, this book, Le Trésor Maudit, is read by a visiting British tourist, a writer named Henry Lincoln, who had written Doctor Who stories, okay? Three, <laughs> three in fact, three of the, this is from some of the lost episodes, so this is the second Doctor, for those that, that follow Doctor Who, uh, The Abominable Snowman, Web of Fear, and The Dominators. So we already know he's got a vivid imagination, and he reads the book, 
And in the book, he sees these documents, which the book says these documents were found in a pillar of the church. And this is one of the documents. And Henry Lincoln is looking at these documents, and he finds a code in the document. And there is a code in the document. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there are certain letters that are raised. Um, let me see if I can get my mouse up here. So you can see, like, there's an A there and, and a D here, and then that A is raised over there, and then there's a, a G and an O. And it, so it's, it's Adagobert. All right, so I'm going to show you. So if you take all the little raised letters, it says, Adagobert du roi, et à Sion, et ce trésor, et elle est l'amour. To King Dagobert II and to Sion does this treasure belong, and it is death, or, and he is there dead. So this was Pierre Plontard's way of saying that the Priory of Sion existed and had a treasure, it, trying to he was trying to tie his prior of Sion to the treasure in Rennes-le-Chateau. So he's trying to conflate these, these different conspiracies to prove his own case. Now, who is King Dagobert II? Real guy. He's in history. He was the last king of the line of the Merovingians, uh, but he was assassinated in the 7th century. So Henry Lincoln reads this, finds the codes, and goes, this is great. He goes back to BBC Two, and he pitches saying, I want to do documentaries about Rennes-le-Chateau. So he does a couple of documentaries in the 1970s, and then he starts writing his own stuff where when he runs out of material about Rennes-le-Chateau, he can start layering on more stuff in order to go on the lecture circuit. He's going around, he's giving talks about Rennes-le-Chateau. So while he's going around the lecture circuit, he runs into, into two other guys that are giving their own talks about their own speculative theories, and these are Bajent and Lee. So the three of them now, we have Lincoln, Bajent, and Lee that are all together, and, and so they, they're sitting around in a hotel room and they're talking about all these things and how does it all fit together? Bajan and Lee, they're more on the, the they're trying to find the Christian conspiracies and more the, the Mary Magdalene side. And, and Lincoln is, is more about, well, Merovingian and, and Sion and these things. And they're sitting around the hotel room going, how is this all connected? How is this all connected? So they're researching the Merovingians. It was this Merowig. Okay, well, okay, Merowig was the last of, or, or, or Dagoberto was the, the last of the Merovingian. Who was the first of the Merovingian line? Well, that was Merowig, lived around the late 5th century. Where did Merowig come from? Well, there's, there's not a lot of information about the 5th century, except a legend that Merowig's mother had been swimming in the ocean where she'd run into a sea serpent that had impregnated her. Okay? That's about all it's done about Merowick. So we got Bajan and, and Lincoln and Lee, and they're sitting around thinking about this. There's something fishy about this story. Okay. <laughs> all right. And the, the, the Quinator. And then they think, fish. Now we have this late fish. Didn't the early Christians have a symbol of a fish as a way of communicating? Therefore, it must mean that Merowick was descended from Jesus Christ. Wow. That was... <laughs> <laughs> that was their thought process. And so this tied into all, you know, both sides, and they're like, this fits, this fits. And so they, they start going on the lecture circuit about all this, about with the Priory of Sion and Dagobert and the treasure that's hidden in the column, and, and a book comes out of it, and that's Holy Blood, Holy Grail, where they're tying it all together. So they have these things that are documents that they think are true, but it's, all, it's planted, it's all forged stuff. So to go over the, this chain of speculation. So 1956, Noel Corbu, innkeeper, Rennes-le-Chateau, starts rumors about a hidden treasure. Then Plontard, con man with his friend, said they published this book, Le Trésor Maudit, with false documents in it to try and confirm the treasure and tie it to their own hoax about the Priory of Sion. And then uh, Henry Lincoln, sci-fi writer, comes in, finds the Scion reference, and starts creating his own books and, and television documentaries about it. And then Lincoln, Bajent, and Lee publish Holy Blood, Holy Grail, saying the Priory of Scion is a fact, because they've seen these documents. Dan Brown comes along, 2003, sees these saying Priory of Scion is a fact. Great story, Mary Magdalene writes Da Vinci Code. So there we have, that we have the whole chain. So a little bit more information, Berger Saunier, it is true that he had a lot of money, this priest, but where did his money come from? Did it come from a tra First of all, there was no hollow pillar in the church. He never found any documents, but he did have a lot of money. Where did the money come from? He was selling indulgences. You send him a franc, <laughs> he'd say, you're getting into heaven, basically. Thriving business, 
totally against the church policy, and he was eventually kicked out of the church for it. So when 60 Minutes did an episode on this whole Rennes Le Chateau thing, Ed Bradley had a wonderful quote about it. He said, the source of Father Sonier's treasure, or wealth, was not some fabulous treasure, but good old-fashioned fraud. <laughs> All right. So a little bit more um, about that big painting, you know, the Mongols. Well, you know, so where did this painting come from? The, there were European, you can find documents from the late 1200s that say the Mongols had captured Jerusalem because the Mongols were making an advance, 1200s, and then, remember, they don't have phone, they don't have internet, they don't have email, so now some of the merchants, you're saying, oh, the, march the Mongols are advancing, the merchants are going to Rome, and saying, oh yeah, the Mongols were advancing, they're probably in Jerusalem right by now, which caused the Europeans to go ecstatic. The Mongols have captured Jerusalem, the Mongols are gonna give Jerusalem back to the Europeans. Huge celebrations, Pope was ordering parades in Rome, they thought it was a fact, and it's been written saying the Mongols captured, they hadn't captured Jerusalem. They had made some advances in, into the, the northern part of the area. That was part of the confusion. Another part of the confusion was that there was a Mongol general named Muley. And some of the historians, later historians who were doing research, saw Muley, didn't really understand what they were talking about, and thought, oh, that must mean Jacques de Molay. So Jacques de Molay must have been in charge of the Mongol army that was capturing Jerusalem in 1299. Story spreads, big painting gets done, gets you know, hanging in Versailles. So it's just kind of layer after layer of, of wishful thinking that's going on. So now Templars. Templars did exist. Templars still exist. There are people today who identify as Templars. Legally, officially, there are Freemasonry organizations have orders of Templars. There's presidents who have been Templars. But some people, they kind of confuse the, the timeline here, saying, well, no, the, the, the medieval Templars were disbanded in the early 1300s. And then there were other organizations, the Freemasons arising in the 1700s and setting up their own Templar organizations. There's a 400-year gap there. But ah, no, we're, we're, we won't pay any attention to that. We, we got a steady line of Templars going all the way back. But no, just because they're called Templars doesn't mean they go all the way back. Um, there's the, the sovereign military order of the temple. Um, many organizations call themselves Templars. Now, if you want to learn about Templars and you want the good stuff, good books to read, Malcolm Barber, considered number one Templar researcher in the world, wrote a wonderful book called The New Knighthood. Definitely worth it. It's a lot of detail in there, but it, it's probably one of the best sources out there. He also wrote Trial of the Templars. Very well researched. Helen Nicholson wrote a great book, Knights Templar, A New History. These books are all good to read. Books not to read. Anything where you take the book and you turn to the back and it says anything about space aliens, don't get that book. Anything that talks about Templars reconquering Jerusalem in 1300, no. Anything that says Templars were associated with the Mongol army, no. Don't get those books. So a couple other things, just trying to fight some of the speculation here. Templars, they didn't have descendants. People say, I'm descended from a Templar. Well, no, they took vows of chastity, okay? They tended not to have children. It wasn't like they were, a, again, the lost tribe of, of Jerusalem. They, they were in a job, in a job. And there were Templars, and then when the organization was disbanded, those people went on to do other things. Also, anybody that's trying to say, and you've got these books, you know, Ivanhoe, and say, you know, Templar, Templars were very anti-Islam, uh, and, and they weren't. Many of them spoke Arabic. There was a lot of mutual respect that went on. On the battlefield, they needed to fight each other, but overall, they, they treated each other pretty well. Also, they were not devil worshipers. These were trumped up charges by King Philip. Um, there, there are some interesting things that after Philip had died and then his sons died, and actually his entire line died out, and that's true. And, and there's some interesting stories there. There's a, a French min, a mini series called Les Rois Maudits, The Accursed Kings, uh, that, that talks about this. And it, but again, that's some, another way to get some more fiction into it. So, summary of all this. So, Knights Templar, real organization, existed 200 years during the Crusades. Good way to think about it is as a multinational corporation. Uh, they were arrested and persecuted starting October 13, 1307, but they've had a massive impact on modern culture. And many stories, it's, it's a very compelling story, and everything just kind of layers on and a little more and a little more, and it, it becomes a wonderful story, but you've got to go back sometimes and just see, okay, what were the facts? And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Were there any questions? Question. What Hi. was the name of the book again? What is the name of, sorry, what? Of the book that you recommend? That you recommend. It's by Malcolm Barber. It's called The New Knighthood. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Any other? I, I'm having trouble seeing. Okay. And Raymond Corey portrays the, the, the order when it was holding Acre as being a very pacifistic where it came to, or very accepting of other religions. Was mm -hmm. any evidence of that anywhere, or are they... There, there was a lot of tolerance. So you know, some people say, oh, well, if, if um, you know, the Muslims were in charge of Jerusalem, that meant Christians couldn't get in. But it, it wasn't that case at all. Saladin and others were, were very tolerant of other religions, saying Chris, these are Christian holy sites. We're protecting these sites and allowing Christians that just want to come worship at those sites to come in to those sites. It's just not so much about the whole military. And, and there, there are some fine points as to who controlled Jerusalem or different cities at different times. Just because an army was there, did that mean it was conquered? Or, or others would argue, no, that an area wasn't conquered unless they'd set up some sort of an administrative system and, and running the government. As for what was actually in Acre, I, I cannot speak to the entire time of it, but I can say that when the Mongols, and the Mongols were a force at the time, so with Genghis Khan's army was, was thundering across Asia and was starting to advance in, into Palestine in that area, these, these um, foes of the Christians and the Muslims both regarded the Mongols as the greater threat, and they actually allied. So it was in, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to get the, I think 12, 67 or so when the Christians didn't really have a strong enough force to fight back the Mongols, but they decided to enter into an alliance with the Muslims and allowed the, the Islamic army to come up and actually camp near Acre and get resupplied from the city in order to then go and engage the Mongols at that battle, which was the Battle of Angelut at, at the Sea of Galilee. And it was the first time that the Mongols were really defeated and, and there were other things going on because the great Khan had just died. So that Battle of Angelut became what was called the high water mark. It was the farthest that the Mongols were able to advance. And then after that, they kind of retreated and then the Mongols kind of came apart into civil war. But it is true that there, were, um, there was cooperation between the Christians and the Muslims from Acre. I have a question, were the, were the Templars, were they influenced by the Sephardic Jews in any way? Were the Templars influenced by the Sephardic Jews? I have not researched the Sephardic Jews. Is there a specific ritual or a specific well, cause item? I, if, if, um, well, because our, our family is Sephardic Jews. And, and, um, and like, for example, like if you go to southern France, mm -hmm. uh, if, like, if you look at all the, the cathedrals in southern France, mm -hmm. if you go to a lot of the cathedrals that are built by the Templars, you'll see actually statues of the demons from the Gosha. Also, mm -hmm. the Picatrix, mm -hmm. which is another gr grimoire written by the Sephardic Jews, mm -hmm. and and I was wondering, is that there's some type of connection with that? Because how would they know about those deities if they were totally two different religions? Well, again, it's it's, it's yeah. people. So when something's being built, I could see that it would probably have elements of whatever the local culture was, right? Um, be, because they they weren't entirely. It wasn't like Neanderthals and and Homo sapien. And, you know, they're getting together. They're living in a town and, and associating. I don't know about the specific things that you're mentioning, um, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there was probably influence going between all the cultures there. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, at a previous Dragon Con, a uh, author had said that the legend of Bahamut came about due to French people misreading Muhammad mm -hmm. as accusations of the Templars worshiping Bahamut mm -hmm. when actually they were being accused of the Templars worshiping Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the whole Bahamut came out, because mm -hmm. in 17, 1800s, people just made stuff right, up. Right. Is, that, is that true? Uh, th there's a lot of speculation. Oh. And uh, Malcolm Barber believes that that's the case, that, that that's what um, Bahamut was. It was that some sort of corruption. Of, and, and that the inquisitors at the time, they didn't really understand the whole history. They didn't understand who Muhammad was. So it, a Templar who's being tortured and is talking about Muhammad, and the inquisitors are trying to jump to any conclusion that they can to find th this guilt. They were accusing the Templars of all kinds of stuff, of urinating on the cross and, and uh, all kinds of nasty stuff. So yeah, I, I think they did get c confused as to what they were accusing the Templars How of. How much did the crown own, own 
owe the Templars? How much did Philip owe the Templars? That's a really good question that I probably run across the answer, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Because they were a major banking institution, mm -hmm. I think, it, mm -hmm. only Christian one, I think, at the times. They, they were the first really multinational banking organization. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair statement. Um, my question uh, is based around your talking about what, how their organizations to, uh, today that claim to be descended from the Templars or what have you. Mm -hmm. What happened to the uh, Portuguese branch that changed their name? The Order of Christ? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, not something that I've researched. Um, I, I don't know what finally happened with them. I don't know if they're still around or if they merged with the Knights Hospital. I would have to check. Because it, it occurs to me that, that if they're still around, they'd have a good claim. Oh, to the, to the wealth of the Templars? But well, not to the wealth, but to being saying that they are the descendants of the Templars. Okay. Hi. So as somebody who must confess likes to watch History Channel a lot, even though I know it's not necessarily very accurate, um, you know, I do see a lot of stuff like this, and then I do get interested in it. Um, but, you know, my background is not history or doing that type of research. So could you tell us a little bit about your methodology and how you do research something like this where there are a lot of, there is a lot of false information yeah. or a lot of false leaves? Because I, I was really impressed with how detailed you went into it, because um, I would confess that I probably wouldn't go to this link. <laughs> and, um, but I am curious, how, how do you really get to the truth? Right, and, and it's a good question, especially when you have so many books. I mean, the first thing is, what is written about? It's, it's a great question. Um, but then, when you have so many books that are saying different things, and it could be about medieval history, it could be about paranormal phenomena, all kinds of things that you're going to have talks here in this track about. The, the number one thing I look at is, who has published this work? And is it a publisher that would be recalled, that would be referred to as a reputable publisher? And what is reputable? A publisher that has a reputation for fact checking and accuracy. If they just publish anything someone says, then that person can say anything. But if there's some sort of peer review involved, then that's going to give it more weight, which still doesn't mean it's 100% accurate. Even a PhD who's going through peer review and doing everything, mistakes still come in. And I've seen books that say that, oh yeah, the Templars existed in, in you know, you know, 950, and no, they didn't. It was just a typo in the book. You know, and then other books may have quoted it as a source because people just weren't entirely doing their research. But there are certain publishing houses, anything that's got university in the name is usually pretty good, Harvard University Press. It, it, those are, are good things to go to. And um, also just look at, at the, the consensus of the sources. Look at several different books and how they are writing things. And if they all kind of tend to say the same thing, give it a little bit more weight. And we go through this on Wikipedia all the time. I'm actually giving a talk about Wikipedia later on here at DragonCon about what to do when there's controversy. And, and this happens all the time. Someone says, well, I've got a book that says this, and I've got a book that says this. And what people, many people in the public um, don't quite grok about Wikipedia is that Wikipedia is not, not there to decide any dispute. It's there to describe the disputes. So if there's 100 books and 40 say one thing and 60 say another, you can say there is dispute among historians. That's the way a Wikipedia article should be written. Now, if there's 90 books that say one something and 10 books that say something different, then on Wikipedia we're going to go with what's called the consensus of historians. But then we can go in and take another layer where someone can say, well, yeah, all these books that were written in the 1900s say this and this, but I've got a book that was written in the 1300s that says da -da 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 -da, that the Mongols were in Jerusalem or whatnot. And so then you, you do have to look at when a book was written. And someone might say it was written in the 1300s. It was a reputable historian in the 1300s. Can we use that as a source on Wikipedia? Well, if nothing's disagreeing with it, okay. But if there's disagreement, then Wikipedia is going to say, not just a historian, but modern historians. Because history builds upon itself. Historians look at that. They look at that painting you know, of Jacques de Molay, 1299, and, and continue doing research and writing new papers on things. And um, I use a lot of books.google.com is a wonderful resource. And scholar.google.com tends to be a lot of good papers. There's also something called JSTOR, which publishes a lot of papers, which you'll find on scholar.google.com. Um, but, um, but yeah, just try and read as many sources. Some people, different people do research different ways. My way is to pick one fact and then get 15 books that talk about that same thing and see how much they agree with each other and do a lot of cross-reference. Thank you. Yeah. The, the only problem with 
that approach is, if you look at some of the most, some of the recent things like by Richard Carrier and others about biblical research, mm -hmm. um, they've, they, at least they're asserting, of course, they're being poo-pooed as just being outliers. And that is that their claims that is that these, that most of the research done on biblical research was done by people who believed all of it before they did any research. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, I would question the idea of a polar, a plural, a plural, many people, I can't consensus. The right word. consensus, a consensus <laughs> saying that. Right. So what I was going to ask, and the reason I came up in the first place mm -hmm. is, have you located any what we would have to consider to be primary type sources that mm -hmm. go back to the same time mm -hmm. as the Templars? Because that mm -hmm. would be at least a little bit more reliable than what people said about what people said about what people said about, well, yeah, he's nodding his head. No, that's not more reliable either. <laughs> yeah. And it's been doctors back then. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it's a great question. and. And my first reaction is correct, question everything. I mean, just because there's a consensus of modern historians doesn't mean they're right either. Um, I'm just saying it's, it's a place to start. And if someone wants to challenge things, what are their sources? I, I had a discussion with Malcolm Barber about, because he came to St. Louis, he was giving a talk about this and this, and I was in, a, in the middle of a heated battle on Wikipedia about something to do with the Mongols being in Jerusalem. And I was asking him pretty much the same thing. How do you know what source, you know, what, you know, how do you know that this happened or that this didn't happen? And he was like, what are the sources? What are your sources? Anybody can say anything. Anybody can say that space aliens captured Jerusalem in 1300s. And, oh yeah, here's a primary source. I found something that has the word moon in it. Therefore, it must mean aliens, you know. Yeah. So uh, the, the definition that Wikipedia uses of, of primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary sources. Primary sources written by someone who's close to the event, no fact checking, or very little fact checking, or any fact checking is done by just that one person. Secondary source is someone who's looking at the primary sources and is trying to synthesize them together and do more peer review and fact checking. Wikipedia generally runs on secondary sources if they're published by reliable printing houses. Um, Harvard University Press, Oxford University Press, and then a tertiary source is one that uses the secondary sources. An encyclopedia is a tertiary source. So when you say go back to primary sources, it depends how we're defining, but if you're saying a primary source of someone who was there at the time, I can come up with many examples of people who were writing sources that were just wrong. You know, we heard that the Mongols were in Jerusalem. Write it down. That's a primary source. So between the, the medieval historians and the modern historians, I, I'm going to give more weight personally to the modern historians who have spent some time talking about it and debating it. And you can find some books, uh, you know, the great debates of history, you know, where did it happen this way or did it happen this way? Discuss and, and then get the students to go and, and write about those things. Um, but I go back to what I said, question everything, that's a great policy to have.